Well, we have a very special episode today. We are talking about separating truth from fiction in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Depending on who you ask, Hamas could be the liberators of the Palestinians fighting against the concentration camp-inducing Zionists. Or, on the other hand, if you watch the Daily Wire, Israel is the champion and possibly even better than the United States. And they were attacked by uh, radical Islamic terrorists and are getting revenge and solving a problem that needs to be solved until the last drop of blood of Palestinians comes into play. But who's right and who's wrong, and where does the truth lie? I'd like to introduce my guest today. We have uh, Austin Peterson from Wake Up America. Welcome back to Nightly Offensive. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Also introducing uh, from Ireland the Irish uh, polemist and also uh, one of the most uh, interesting and loud voices about this issue, Keith Woods. Welcome to Nightly Offensive for the first time. Great to be here, Elijah. Fantastic. So we got the good looking gentleman here. We have a great uh, topic. And the reason why we've got to talk about this is something so important. Uh, the U.S. is at the brink of getting involved in this conflict, and we don't know what's truth and what's not. There is an interesting topic going around that the uh, Hamas militants, or if you ask the New York Times to call them gunmen, were literally saying... Um, the Hamas is decapitating babies. And if you're like me, you know that that's a very serious issue. I have a six-month-old baby. I don't even like to see his uh, nails cut off because he'll cry a little bit, let alone his head. But uh, it didn't stop Biden from weighing in. Biden talked about the fact that this is a verified report. I want you to listen to this. This is very important as we talk about this issue. He said that he saw images of Hamas terrorists decapitating babies. Check this out. I never really thought that I would see and have confirmed pictures of terrorists beheading children. I never thought I'd ever, anyway, I, uh, but there are countries in the region that are trying to be of some help, including Arab nations <clears throat> trying to be of some help. So, uh, anyway. All right, let's jump into this. Austin Peterson, I'm going to give you a moment to explain your position. Where do you stand on this current conflict between Hamas and Israel? you got 60 seconds. Yeah, for sure. So, so people can understand where I'm coming from. You know, I'm an American citizen, and I care about America first. I think Vivek Ramaswamy actually articulated the best America first position of all the presidential candidates the other night when he said that we offer diplomatic support to Israel, we offer moral support to Israel in this conflict, but he didn't say financial or military support. And that's really where I come from. I consider myself to be an America first libertarian. But I think it's a mistake to take anything Joe Biden says seriously, especially because uh, our friend Jason Rank just showed us that the White House spokesman have confirmed that U.S. officials have not confirmed these pictures or atrocities in Israel that Joe Biden has discussed here. It's a mistake to listen to anything he says because he's a doddering old man. He probably is hallucinating because he's in the, the depths of senility. And we all know that the first casualty in war, uh, in war is the truth. That being said, there have been some confirmed reports, at least, of the atrocities that have been waged against civilians who are at this music festival. And, of course, a war is ongoing. So what we know for a fact, we can say, is that there have been atrocities that have been committed by Hamas against at least a thousand people in this initial conflict and i think that the mistake that's being made is that there's some kind of a moral equivalence between these two i look at this if you look at this beyond good and evil and i'll wrap it up by saying this if you look at this as beyond they killed babies they killed babies moral outrage moral outrage what we're really looking at here from a meta conflict is a, the classic conflict of civilizations it's the clash of civilizations not unlike the Americans when we had the fight with the Native Americans or with the Rome fighting the barbarians uh, in, in ancient history it's the classic class of civilizations if you can get beyond if you can look at it from a meta analysis everything makes a lot more sense in my opinion awesome uh, Keith so we can jump into this uh, give me your initial just position overall Israel Hamas conflict uh, where do you stand uh, on the issue and what is your uh, diagnosis of the situation well, I'm glad to hear Austin is, is rightly skeptical of the beating of the war drums right now. These stories are coming out. We're hearing all of this atrocity propaganda. None of it is verified. I know Austin said that there's confirmed uh, a thousand casualties in Hamas atrocities. Uh, I don't see any evidence of that. I don't see any good evidence of a civilian massacre that happened at the rave. 
all these stories of some mass rape and mass slaughter that happened at this rave was based on one eyewitness report, as was the story of the dead babies. It was one eyewitness report from a, a radical uh, Jewish extremist that runs a settler group that has made pro-genocide comments about Palestinians. So they're beating the war drums. We're getting all these fake stories. I do agree there is no moral equivalence. I don't think it's at all the same thing. They're locked in an open air concentration camp. Uh, denied the basic necessities required for life. And those people try and break out of that concentration camp. I don't think that's, that there's at all a moral equivalence between that and what we're seeing the Israeli army do, which is bomb civilian areas, carpet bombing, no regard for civilian life. I don't think you can draw a moral equivalence at all. All right, so let's, uh, we're going to jump into that. And of course, before we talk about that, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor because we have some amazing stories that we're talking about today. This is My Vital C, and you've got to check it out if you haven't already. Listen, if you are over the age of 35 or you're like me or you're even over 30 and you're like any typical American, you start to feel tired around noon and your ability to focus just keeps getting worse as you get older. For energy, you might have tried, tried coffee, uh, perhaps you even tried tea or other sugary drinks that promises energy for hours. But these just honestly don't work. They can leave you jittered, and you need something that actually has your focus improve. Now, I don't want to talk about the crash that happens after these products, because if you drink too much, you end up falling asleep. But I can pretty much guarantee that what I'm about to t share with you, you've never heard of. This supplement is based on a molecule Big Pharma doesn't want you to know about, and that is because Big Pharma knows how effective it is, and they can't make any money off of it. Typical. In my case, this is the strongest and easiest focus and energy supplement that I've ever tried. And unlike caffeine, tea, and other addictive supplements, which I'm trying to wean off of, I don't crash afterwards. And surprisingly, I sleep better at night, even though I take it in the morning. You can uh, add to its history of dramatically improving the life of its test subject. My Vital C is made with just two ingredients, olive oil and a powerful nano antioxidant, 125 times more powerful than vitamin C called ESS60. It is also backed by a full 30-day money-back guarantee. My guests are on the screen here. You're going to go to myvitalc.com, M-Y-V-I-T-A-L-C.com slash offensive. That's myvitalc.com slash offensive. Use my coupon code offensive at checkout for $15 off your initial order. Check it out. This product can ra radically change your life if you're looking for that energy to get over the slump of the day. Check it out, myvitalc.com slash offensive. Links in the description. Support yourself, support our sponsors, and support this show directly. All right, these, these claims were made, and we're talking, if you're just joining in live, about the Israel versus Hamas explaining truth from fiction, and I want to start with an initial question, which is extremely important. Uh, we're going to go to Austin first. Uh, do you think that this is a genuine, uh, the, the narrative behind this attack that started this war, that uh, Israel got thrown off guard and Hamas just came out of the middle of nowhere, sent paragliders, that this is an, a real narrative, this is a believable narrative, uh, or do you uh, have a different alternative take, such as the fact that we have reports coming out that uh, Egypt had warned three days earlier the Israeli leadership about Hamas attack, and perhaps like 9-11 people are saying maybe Bush didn't do 9-11, maybe Netanyahu didn't do the Hamas attack, but he might have let it happen in order to get his uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. What do you think the narrative is? Do you agree with the official narrative or do you have an alternative? Well, as much as I despise the official leadership and the, the American governments and think that the uh, government model runs mostly on a socialist model, which I completely and fundamentally disagree with, the way that I look at these intelligence agencies is to remind myself that the CIA, the Mossad and the IDF and, and uh, MI6 they're basically like the DMV for intelligence agencies, right? They're subject to the same problems that the other government bureaucracies are subject to. And in many ways, you know, if you are to put yourself in these intelligence agents' shoes, if you're to say, well, what would I do if I was in the situation? When you have literally hundreds and hundreds of threats that are coming at you, some of them false, some of them real a single day, you may not flag the one that's the right one because of just typical government, you know, bureaucracy and, and mismanagement, mishandling, but also just because when you have so many threats, it's difficult to know where they're coming from. But again, this is an intelligence failure the same way that 9-11 was an intelligence failure. And I think that absolutely heads should roll. I mean, not to, to no pun in there, but uh, in, in regards to the people who are responsible for allowing something like this to happen. And, you know, Keith, I'm glad that we agree the United States should not be getting involved in this conflict. But I think it's a misnomer to say that Gaza is a concentration camp. People want to escape from concentration camps. People try and escape from concentration camps. If the people in Gaza were in what we might call a concentration camp, they would be fleeing. They would be running away. And I, I just saw a report an hour ago. It looks as if Egypt is trying to prevent them from fleeing. Uh, Egypt is building a wall, apparently more effectively than we can do here in the United States, 
to prevent them from coming in. But at, at the moment, if a, lo- if a lot of these people are choosing to stay there, you have to wonder, is it really the kind of con- is it really the kind of terrible conditions that people claim that they are? But at the end of the day, I think that the solution, again, looking at this from a meta example, the solution is very likely going to have to be something like annexation and some form of a referendum, because I think Israel, being the more technologically advanced civilization, is going to have to say, we're not going to tolerate the security threat on our border anymore, and we're going to have to offer these people the full human rights of Israeli citizens, which would essentially mean subsuming the Gaza Strip into the nation of Israel. Keith, I'm going to throw to you on that same question, and also if you have any response to what Austin said. As far as the intelligence failure, I mean, it's certainly worth speculating about how they could have missed an attack this big. But at the same time, I think certainly Hamas pulled off something very impressive in the tactics they used. You know, we saw this uh, sensational footage of of the paragliders and so on, and uh, the things Austin alluded to as well, the fact that uh, they do have this uh, constant threat. There may have been some support from from Iran or Hezbollah. So it's it's difficult to speculate. I've seen that report that Egypt gave them warning that there was some kind of foreknowledge. Um, you know, I'm not coming down strongly on, on one side or the other of that. But as far as, well, if, if Gaza was a concentration camp, they would leave. Well, they can't. They're under blockade. There's a no-go zone surrounding Gaza that if people step into, they will be fired at by Israeli soldiers. The sea is also blockaded. Uh, the Zionist government just closed off a, a cross into Egypt. These people are locked inside this open air concentration camp. It's 2.1 million people. Half of them are children. The unemployment rate has been 60 to 70 percent for decades now. Over 90 percent of the water is, is contaminated and considered undrinkable. These people live in, in some of the worst conditions of any people anywhere on Earth. Um, as far as them being subsumed uh, into Israel, I mean, there's an ongoing ethnic cleansing that is being carried out by the Zionist government that is driving this. There are over 600,000 illegal settlers in the West Bank that are considered illegal under international law. Uh, you can draw on, on older forms of colonialism, but I don't think this compares at all to something like uh, the expansion into the United States or or Australia or these examples of of European colonialism. I mean, in these cases, these are people that are having their homes seized today. You know, I understand you're a libertarian, but there are people in the West Bank that have the deeds to their home that are being forced out by these settlers. There are hundreds of thousands of refugees from the Nakba who have the deeds from their grandparents' homes where they were forced out of their ancestral land. So if you want to portray it as a clash of civilizations and this is, you know, Muslim hordes versus uh, Judeo-Christianity or something, well, I don't think that's what's happening here. I think this is a, an ethnic conflict and I think it's it's in large part being driven by the, the supremacist attitudes that are common within Israel, within the Israeli government um, and this apocalyptic messianic Judaism uh, that is in sight intentions as it relates to the holy sites. Austin, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, if we, you know, if you don't believe it's a clash of civilizations, I mean, we're not going to be able to sort of have an agreement. I hope that I could to change your mind on that, because, you know, I do see I, I sort of pull from Ayn Rand on this one who sees this as uh, uh, the from the clash of civilizations perspective. She sees the Israelis as the advanced technological civilization, and she uh, described the Palestinians as barbaric. Savage. And let's compare this perhaps to Hernan Cor- Cortez and the the conquering of the Aztecs and the Mayans, right? Right. The the Catholics came in and they settled Mexico and South America, and they said there would be no more human sacrifices. For example, I mean, how long uh, must a civilized nation tolerate barbarity at its gates? How long? I mean, look at it. Uh, I know a lot of American libertarians and conservatives who are concerned about what's happening on the southern border. All right, I must must we tolerate the invasion on our southern border? For example, I think a lot of people say that we need more security in that situation, and I, and I know that Israel is going to act in their own best interest because again, beyond the concept of good and evil, looking at this at a meta perspective, these people are going are doing what is in their best interest. Human beings, we frequently like to separate ourselves from the animal kingdom. But when you actually look at people's behaviors, they always tend to act in their own best interests. So I, I very much see this as analogous to American expansionism and the 
the fighting between the American pioneers and savages of the Indian tribes at that time. Those people definitely got a better deal than Gaza did. They don't even pay income taxes in this country. Uh, the Gazans can get that good of a deal. I think they'd be much better off than the Native Americans. But here's the thing I'd like to say about this, is that is that there was they had this incredible ingenuity in launching this attack. The Palestinians put together, coordinated this attack. Think about all the time, the energy, and the money, and the resources they put into this. If they had taken half of the time and that energy, and instead of putting it into violence, had actually sunk that back into the infrastructure or building up their communities, instead of launching this attack, think about how much better off they would be. But I think that you know they are analogous to the Native Americans. I think they are acting as savages. Uh, and I think that they're going to ultimately, whether you like it or not, or whether or not, they will be treated as the savages were, like the Aztecs, like the Mayans, like the Incans, uh, and, and they will be relegated to the dustbin of history, and it will be all due to their own behavior. And before you respond, Keith, I want to bring up something, uh, a topic on this um, that is very important. Uh, you know, a lot of what we're talking about rests on the fact of whether what we're seeing is true or not. And I want to bring up this topic about wartime uh, atrocity propaganda, um, because the entire predication of both sides rests on one simple fact, that the other side has been committing war crimes against them and that they've been committing acts of terrorism. I want to point this out, and I think this is absolutely crazy. Uh, in 2023, I condemn terrorism. The only problem with this is is that when you talk to Hamas, uh, you know, leadership, or you talk to Palestinians in Gaza, they would literally say that Israel is an occupied land, that they're, set, they're settlers, colonizers, and that they actually are terrorists. Uh, but of course, if you spoke to any Israeli or Zionist, um, or even just mostly any neutral American, they would say that obviously Gaza is under terrorist uh, leadership, and Hamas is a terrorist organization that has been committing acts of terror, and that the IDF is the most restrained military in the history of the world. So uh, when I brought this up, I thought this was kind of crazy. We talk about wartime atrocities. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. had shared a very graphic video that I can't even play here on YouTube of uh, militants shooting a family. Okay, they were on the floor. If you if you like snuff and you like gore, feel free to check that out. I don't want to ever see it again. But uh, myself, I believe you also, Keith, uh, had put up that this was video was from 2015. Um, it was from Syria. This is from The Wired. They said that a graphic Hamas video uh, Donald Trump Jr. shared on X is actually real, that research confirms that a video posted by Donald Trump Jr. showing Hamas militants attacking Israelis was falsely flagged in a community note as being years old, thus making X's disinformation problem worse, not better. Uh, you can read the whole story there. But I want to throw to you, Keith, on this, um, because you've been talking a lot about that uh, there's a lot of uh, maybe pro-Israel wartime atrocity prop propaganda. Uh, but from my understanding, you also thought this video was fake. They're saying it's real. I, I don't know if you know the truth here, uh, but I'd love to hear your comment on how much you think uh, is uh, what we're seeing real or fake and on this story specifically, what your view is. Do you believe this is real or do you believe this was not real? Uh, you have the floor. Well, that's the first time I've seen that article, but the, the video that Trump Jr. shared, I mean, the corpses in that video were clearly Arabs. They weren't Israelis. Uh, there was no sign of any Hamas uh, paraphernalia or uniforms. Um, most of these videos of, of atrocity propaganda that have come out so far have been fake. There was a video that was widely shared around of supposedly burned Israeli bodies uh, piled on top of each other that it seems now were Hamas fighters and they were in IDF body bags. But before we get on to that, topic because i think we could cover that for a while i would like to just respond to what some of austin said first of all i totally reject this uh, supremacist narrative that you know the the jewish settlers are sort of innately supreme to the arabs there uh, and that therefore they have a, a right to wipe them out and take their land uh, i totally reject these kinds of supremacist narratives and even if you wanted to go with that uh we don't know the capabilities of these people because they have been denied a country, denied a state. They are locked in an open air prison camp. You said uh, if they were so successful or if they put as much effort into building their economy as they did these attacks, uh, then they might be doing a lot better. Well, 85% of their fishing waters are inaccessible. Uh, 30 to 40% of their famine land is inaccessible. I don't think we can really know the capabilities of these people when they're under these conditions when all trade into and out of Gaza is monitored by this blockade, by an occupying power. It's not really going according to uh, free market principles when they can't trade with the outside world, when they have this permanently high unemployment rate. 
And, you know, you have Palestinians like uh, Nayib Bukele, who's, who's been very impressive. Uh, I talked to a, a, a Palestinian-American on my channel last week, Richard Hanania. He's become one of the top uh, intellectuals in, in the conservative movement. Uh, I think certainly some of the diaspora of these people are, are very impressive. And this idea that they're uh, necessarily savages because Gaza is in such a, a state that it's in. Well, again, that, that just ignores the reality of, of the Zionist occupation that's forcing this. But also the argument seems confused because on the one hand, I'm getting, I'm hearing this kind of Randian, amoral, the only thing that drives history is, is will to power. And if, if people get wiped out, then in virtue of being wiped out, they deserve it. Like this kind of might is right narrative. But then I'm hearing, uh, you know, atrocities from Hamas and uh, a thousand casualties and these role unjustified and these words like terrorism. Well, you know, if we just live in this uh, this amoral world where might is right and it's just the, the will of the conqueror, then I don't see how anyone could condemn the Hamas attacks because they're trying to do the, the same thing Israel is doing, right? They're, they're fighting this, this war of all against all. They're trying to uh, assert their will to power. Um, so it seems kind of confused. Do we have a... That's not what they're doing. But that's, but that's not what Israel is doing because there is no moral equivalence between the two. So you, when Israel is a strike into Palestinian territory, Territory. They don't go to the music festivals and capture their women and spit on their corpses and parade them through the streets. So there's no there's no moral here. And in, in some ways, you're kind of describing uh, Schrodinger's Muslim, right? On the one hand, you're saying, "Oh, these poor people. They have access to fishing water. They don't have the ability to do this." And then on the other hand, accomplish this incredible airstrike. They can't escape their own country. But somehow they can launch themselves uh, using paragliders uh, over into Israeli territory. So clearly some of them can escape. So, so let me ask you something. I mean, are they too stupid to figure out the problems, to figure all the pro problems? That, uh, by the way, all of us are in a conflict with the world. We're all being oppressed by the world. None of us are any special victimhood. I don't give special victimhood status to the people of Palestinians any more than I do the black residents in the south side of Chicago who cry all day about how the terrible white man is oppressing them on a single day. We're all being oppressed by nature and we all have to deal with shit circumstances and we have to make of it. So, I mean, are they extremely capable and they pull off these incredible attacks and incur into, I guess, one of the most powerful militaries in the world? Or are they just poor little helpless Muslims who are just being oppressed by are they Are they great and they powerful and capable or are they incapable of doing some things? Because we've all got a shit sandwich and everyone's got to take a bite sometimes. Well, what I'm saying is that the the case of, of that speaks against your point, because you can see that these people uh, were capable of, of launching a, a pretty impressive strike okay. against the Zionist state. But you're, it, the, it's not like a, a, an equal position here. I mean, it's not comparable to, to blacks in America, where they do have civil rights law, they do have equal treatment under the law. These people are locked in the most one of the most densely populated areas in the world. They're under permanent blockade. Uh, they can't trade with the outside world. They have these uh, tunnels that they dig to try and get aid from Egypt. Um, lots of necessary goods can't be brought into Gaza. People try and bring humanitarian aid ships and they get fired on by the Zionist military. Uh, so I don't think you can take those conditions and say this is a sign of a, a people being innately inferior. And as far as the, the moral equivalence, um, again, there's no indication that the, the descent on the rave turned into some kind of mass slaughter. The latest footage to come out from that is uh, Israeli police officers were at the rave firing on the Hamas soldiers and uh, civilians were there in cover with the Israeli police. Some people have said they were using this, them as human shields. I don't think the footage confirms that, but certainly they were caught in the crossfire. But yeah, there's not a moral equivalence. That, were, that was people that were striking out of a concentration camp versus you know what you had in, in the 2014 Gaza war where Israel destroyed 18,000 homes. They killed 2,200 people, the vast majority of them civilians, half of them women and children. There's no moral equivalence between people doing a targeted strike that mostly attack military bases to break out of a concentration camp uh, and shelling residential areas containing women and children where half the population is children uh, as a form of racial revenge. And we're seeing this exact language used. A member of the Israeli Knesset is on Twitter saying that there are no innocents in Gaza, including, including the children, and advocating that Gaza be leveled. So these people believe that it's acceptable to wipe out a million children as a form of collective racial revenge. I don't see any moral equivalence at all. 
I'll ask you. Well, congratula if, uh, I mean, congratulations. If, if, you found, I mean, congratulations. You found one retarded Israeli congressman. I could give you 25 retarded American congressmen here. So things that are how about coherent. the Israeli I mean, security the minister problem, that called the them human is, cattle? But, but, but again, sorry, go ahead. What did you say? I just said, how about the Israeli security minister that called them human cattle before he launched this uh, attack on Gaza and said that they were going to do collective punishment by cutting off the water supply and electricity? Yeah, you know, people who seems are like emotional, a common sense. People sentiment, who are emotional are going to say and do emotional things. But the reason why the Israelis have the moral high ground, because rather than the target of their attacks being li li there's a difference. And, and I have to explain this to people quite frequently. There's a difference between murder in the first degree and something like involuntary manslaughter. Uh, for example, I, I frequently have to debate with libertarians about the legitimate use of the nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who claim you know, always their moral outrage over something like this. And they forget that one of the policies of the United States government was to drop these leaflets, the LeMay leaflets, which was to warn the Japanese citizens and to let the civilians know that there was going to be a strike. That's, that is a sign that you are the good guys. And Hamas didn't do that, right? And so in this conflict, Israel frequently lets people know in certain neighborhoods, pings their phones to let them know. They also have a technology that they call a roof knock, where they actually, before they fire a building and blow it up, they'll actually drop a bomb on the roof that's a dud to let them know, boom, to shake the building for them to get out of the building. So again, you know, if there is, you know, to be any kind of discussion about a moral high ground in this, the moral high ground definitely rests with the people who are letting the civilians know to get out of the way. I don't if you go and you put yourself up into an orphanage or in a hospital, set up your set up your camp in an orphanage, an orphanage or a hospital deliberately and you fire on me and I fire back. You're the one who bears the moral responsibility for setting yourself up amongst the civilian population. You're the one who's acting like a dog and acting like a rat, acting like someone who is not of the same civilization that someone like ourselves are, because Israel being the more advanced nation, they're, they're that reason, they're that way for a reason, because they act civilized. And that's why they deserve the moral high ground, because they behave in such a way and they conduct warfare in such a way. They don't, they don't go and attack music festivals. I mean, your moralizing is totally selective. You turn it on for the Palestinians and you turn it off for the Zionists. Attacking the music festival is, is, is the worst crime imaginable. And at the same time, you're here justifying the genocide of an entire people on the basis of Jewish racial supremacy. Um, you know, uh, uh, you could make the same case. The same case could have been made of, uh, for the Irish in one time that their lack of economic development proved that there were uh, subhumans that deserved to be wiped out. Do you, do you believe that about the Irish? I mean, why do you think it's acceptable to have this racial supremacist attitude for the Jewish people? And then to go and moralize about this attack on a rave where we have no evidence of, of mass civilian casualties. We have no evidence of these mass rapes. All of the video footage I've I mean, seen you, of the Hamas you, attacks were I mean, pretty, you, you, were pretty you, concretely you focused on attacking military bases. Are, and you're going to defend the genocide and wiping out of an entire are, nation. Are, and you're going to moralize genocide, about genocide, people genocide. breaking out of their concentration I mean, yeah, I mean you might... Like, you, you sound like a member of the squad, like AOC or Rashida Tlaib, genocide, concentration camps and different uh, things like that. Like, uh, first of all, the Jews are not a race. They're a religion and a culture. There's between Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews, right? So if you're going to say this is some racial conflict or something like that, it would be better if you could actually learn the terms that you're using before you fling them sound like some leftist on the streets of New York City, sound like one of the homos for Hamas. And, and trust me, like the, the the members of Hamas, if they were to get their hands on you, uh, Keith, they would definitely treat you the same way that they treat the Jews and see you a, as an enemy uh, of their own civilization, and they'd put your head on a pike as well. So, so I mean, I, it, there's a complete incoherence, not only an incoherence in your views, but you're also using your terms incorrectly, and you have no understanding of the Jewish people and the difference between what is a race, what is a culture, and what is a religion. So you might want to go back to the drawing board to understand the Jewish people first before you start mislabeling. Get your facts straight first, then you can distort them as you please, as Mark Twain might say. 
Uh, if the Jews are just a culture, then how come you can take a, a 23 and Me test and it will show up Jewish? I mean, what is Woody Allen? Woody Allen is an atheist. Uh, Noam Chomsky is an atheist. Uh, Norman Finkelstein is an atheist. Are those Jewish people? The Jews have always conceived themselves as a people. It's in their holy books. Uh, they're a people of common descent. And they have a culture and religion based around that. Even their religion, though, is based uh, around that interconnectedness of common descent and seeing themselves as a race. Uh, so that's a, a pretty bizarre line of argument to say that it's just a religion. I mean, there's many atheists uh, in Israel. I mean, Elijah and I are both married to Jewish women, so we can ask our wives. And I, in this conversation that we frequently have, so uh, it's you know, they're not a race. Well, let me let me let me bring this okay, up. I, 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 well, okay. So, so we disagree on that point, but I want to I want to bring something up very, very, very important here that is uh, interesting. So, obviously, we disagree on if they're a race or a, or a religion, and I'm going to stay out of this argument entirely, uh, and I'm not going to give my opinions at all probably in this entire um, debate just because I want to keep these things neutral and I want to have both sides to make their own case. Um, but we're talking about the idea uh, to to kind of flip the subject here about this uh, atrocity propaganda. And uh, I wanted to, to bring up some examples, right, on both sides. Uh, this idea of talking about how Israel, I mean, uh, Hamas is uh, is attacking things. We see images like this being brought up, right, by uh, this individual saying Hamas rocket hit a mosque in Abu Ghosh near Jerusalem. Hamas targets Muslims. Hamas is the enemy of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Just some random picture with no context, uh, no sources, absolutely nothing at all. And then when you see images like this, as well, I want to bring up uh, something more alarming uh, from the Israeli government, right? You see this, uh, they said Hamas is ISIS with an F. No, it says uh, Hamas is ISIS. Uh, they have this uh, sort of similar weapons of mass destruction mentality going, right? Because ISIS is the WMD of Islamic extremism. Uh, community notes, I believe, noted that ISIS and Hamas are ideologically opposed to one another, though they come from the same religion. And ISIS actually views Hamas as apostates. Makes sense, though. I mean, there are different sects of, of Islam. They're not all one people. And, you know, not all Islamic countries are Arab. Uh, so we see this. On the flip side, um, it's obviously not just uh, it's not just uh, Americans. I mean, sorry, it's not just Hamas or Israel lying about about. Uh, it's not just Israel lying about uh, Hamas or Hamas lying about Israel. You see both sides sort of sharing um, uh, quite a bit of content, including like I saw a picture of a of rubble, and there was a man sitting there, and it just said Israel blew up his whole family, and this is him, and he had a big bear. I can't find the video right here, so we're seeing it from both sides. Um, I want to jump to Austin, and I want to ask that the, you know your perspective on this. Are the images and the the like who's correct? I'll just say this: who's correct? Are both sides lying? Are both sides telling the truth, or is one side more evil than the other? Uh, what do you think the evidence proves? Austin, we'll start with you. Both sides are lying. Uh, and as I said earlier, I go back to that well. I do think that for the first casualty in war is the truth. I think probably the thing that we're all missing in this discussion, this debate, and we, we really need to focus on is maybe the things that we agree on, which is the, the danger that is posed to the United States getting involved in this conflict, conflict and sparking a broader war. I mean, you, I think, mentioned either beginning of this of this segment or perhaps even before we got started that, you know, Lindsey Graham has already threatened to bomb Iran. You know, the neoconservatives are already trying to line up behind Nikki Haley because they're terrified that, um, that Ron DeSantis is not going to have the power to be able to overthrow Trump. I mean, we have a lot of domestic problems here in the United States. So I, I don't understand so much why so Americans are so fixated on this conflict other than the sort of... Um, is it dis the dispensationalists or the, the fundamentalist Christians in the United States? Of course, many of them long for the, the end times and they see a conflict in the Middle East, specifically with Israel as being like a sign of the end times, right? And they, and they desire this conflict. They, they want to egg it on and they want Americans to get involved in this, in this struggle because they see it as a, you know, the ultimate finale, the, the, the final curtain uh, before Christ's return which of course is a dangerous ideology which could lead to the possibility of nuclear war and the destruction of the entire planet. So I do hope that we're not missing the forest for the trees in this discussion and that, you know, I think that at least that the three of us probably believe that it's in the United States best interest to stay out of it. And, and I wonder if maybe, you know, if Keith perhaps, you know, agrees with, uh, with me on at least that position and that it is of utmost importance for us in the United States, who at least broadly consider ourselves to be part of the right, to prevent the neoconservatives from establishing power and returning to power 
you know, underneath the cloak of a, a Nikki Haley, if you will. And honestly, I have not heard a foreign policy and America force policy, foreign policy being articulated by Ron DeSantis. So at, at this moment, I, I think probably, and I say this as someone who's never worn a MAGA hat, uh, but who will uh, if, uh, if push comes to shove, that Donald Trump may be our best bet for preventing the outbreak of World War III next year. And I, as someone who literally ran against him in 2016 uh, when I ran for president, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I might be about prepared to endorse Donald Trump because his America first foreign policy is probably the best bet we have to prevent a wider conflict. I wonder what Keith and, and perhaps you, Elijah, have to say about that. Go ahead, Keith. I'll give you the floor on this one. Well, first of all, as far as the disinformation, I think it's it's pretty one sided in terms of we have a, a Zionist controlled media and even the, you know, distant influencers like like Ben Shapiro and these people that prop up the conservative movement. They've been pumping out this stuff nonstop. Ben Shapiro yesterday retweeted a, a claim by an Indian person that I don't know if this person was even uh, in Israel that was claiming that he had evidence that babies were being ripped out of pregnant women and, and having their umbilical cords cut and left to die by Hamas. And he said he couldn't provide any evidence. Uh, his, he said his friend had the photos. Uh, he was retweeting a, a video of supposedly Hamas uh, shooting civilians inside their car. And it was very clear in the video that the, the gunfire was coming from somewhere else and they never even shot anyone. Um, so he's boosting any kind of atrocity propaganda he can find. I mean, I've, I've kind of lost count of all of the, the fake videos that, that turned out to be something else. There was supposedly Israeli kids being kept in cages by Hamas. It turned out it was years old footage of Palestinian children, actually. Ian Miles Chong, who's another one of these big influencers, suddenly he got very political when it came to this issue. And he was posting a video of, of people that were clearly Israeli police with Israeli police uniforms saying that this was video evidence of Hamas going door to door, slaughtering Israeli families in their homes. We have this bizarre story about the 40 beheaded babies that comes from one source, uh, which, as I said, is a guy who runs a settler organization that's uh, that works closely with the Israeli government and in the past has made uh, pro genocide comments about the Palestinians. Uh, there was actually another journalist on the scene that said none of the Israeli soldiers reported anything like that. But on the basis of this one eyewitness report from a source that's certainly not credible and nothing confirmed by the IDF, no corroborating evidence provided, we've had this reported across the Western media. I mean, I saw there was a headline in, in the, the Daily Mail in the UK today saying that this was the second Holocaust. And again, this is on the basis of one report. This is totally out of control, this level of disinformation. Uh, I'm glad to see Austin agrees about keeping the US out of this conflict, at least. But and it's like he's, he's kind of speaking out of both sides of his mouth because he supports the Israeli narrative. He supports the idea that this is uh, equivalent to, um, you know, settlers of the past. And I think he's ignoring the supremacist element that's driving this. You know, this attack was termed the Al-Aqsa flood by Hamas related to the Al-Aqsa mosque. And that's because there's been months of Jewish supremacist Talmudic groups like the Temple Institute that believe that they have to build a third Jewish temple on the site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the site that's revered by Muslims. Um, they've been antagonizing Christians and Muslims at their holy sites. A few days before this attack, uh, one of these Talmudic groups stormed the mosque and forced worshippers out. They had the support of the IDF in doing that. They've been spitting at Christians in the streets. Uh, they've been smashing up Christian cemeteries and statues of Christ. Uh, they're destroying what they consider idols of Christians and Muslims to bring about this uh, this this apocalyptic prophecy. And the concerning thing is that these people have the support of the Israeli government. They have a lot of support within the Likud government. Uh, a former minister of Benjamin Netanyahu's government was a big donor to the Temple Institute. And these are the kinds of supremacist attitudes that are common. You can go and look up Rabbi Chaim Richman, who was head of the Temple Institute for 30 years, he put out a podcast this week after these attacks where he said that all non-Jews should be worshipping the Jews collectively, and he referred to Arabs as orcs repeatedly. Um, so he's a total Jewish supremacist. And again, these kinds of groups are increasingly common. Uh, Israel has provided funding to the Temple Institute. It's also began to teach a lot of this stuff to Israeli children in schools. 
And these attitudes are getting more and more common where you have Israeli ministers and members of the Knesset coming out saying that they approve of building this temple on uh, this this uh, land that's very holy to Muslims. And that is something that could legitimately spark a world war. Um, so as long as you're supporting that, you know, you can say you're opposed to U.S. direct involvement, but that's really what's driving this conflict and risks bringing other Muslim countries into the conflict as well. Uh, so before you respond, yeah, I do want to bring I, I want to bring something up. I just need to, I need to point this out. This is really important um, that, that we're seeing. You know, uh, you said uh, you talked about not having the neocons in power and the idea that this is not our conflict. You said a few things. And just because of time, I want to make sure that, that we point this out. Um, it is the goal, uh, ostensibly, for the U.S., uh, at least the neocons, do want escalatory uh, conflict. I don't know why, um, per se. I, I don't think I have the answer to that. I need to play a very clear clip uh, here of uh, the Antichrist, Lindsey Graham on uh, CNN. Um, if it doesn't make your position clear, right? I mean, obviously he talked about, you can watch a clip where he said that this is a holy war. That is also a true and false statement. It's not our holy war, but it is someone's holy war. Uh, I think it's funny Nick Fuentes got in trouble for saying less than that. And uh, some of his statements recently about waging a holy war uh, were enough to keep him off uh, from getting reinstated back on Twitter. Uh, but then uh, if you call for a holy war on TV for Israel, then you're fine. Uh, check out this clip real fast where he's very clear on the position of the neocons if they get back into majority power in congress listen all infrastructure the money financing terrorism comes from iran it's time for this terrorist state to pay a price for financing and supporting all this chaos yes if you're the iranians if we're up to me this war escalates i'm coming after you i think this is what i'm trying to clarify here because i I'm wondering us if us in Israel, us in Israel, us, the United States no, and no, Israel. No, I will be crystal clear. The United. So let, me just, let me just let me just let me just understand yeah, you, yes, just sorry. to be clear. You're saying yeah. that you would want the United States and Israel to bomb Iran, even in the absence you of direct it. evidence of their involvement in this uh, attack. Yeah. All right, Austin, I'm going to go to you. You can respond to, to Keith, but also I want to make sure you have this question that you're able to lead into right now about uh, the idea of this being a holy war, like Lindsey Graham said, and what responsibility, if any, does the U.S. have uh, both now in the conflict and if tensions rose with other Arab countries? Uh, go ahead and respond and uh, let me know your, your thought of U.S. involvement again with the current conflict in terms of arms deal or however it is, because they are our greatest ally, according to the Biden administration. Uh, and uh, that being said, if it does escalate, with Iran or with Qatar or some greater conflict, what do you think the U.S. should do? Go ahead. Sure. Well, you know, despite the fact this is a debate, I don't want to be reflexively oppositional to everything Keith, Keith said, because I think Keith actually makes some good points. And I do think that the ultra-Orthodox community of Israel does create more tension and create more enmity towards the people of Israel because of their horrible behavior towards Christians and Muslims, of course, that has to do with the fact that these are, you know, the three Abrahamic religions that have been at war with one another since uh, I think two or three hundred uh, A.D. But uh, you know, I'm not religious. You know, with, I, I believe that with or without religion, you know, good people can behave well and bad people can do evil. But for good people to do evil, that takes religion. So you know, if you can't step back and take a look at this. Uh, from the meta angle, as I do, and try and look at it as objectively as possible, then you know there's there really is not going to be a solution to something like this because it's you're just going to come down on the side of which whichever particular faith that you have. And as someone who's an outsider looking in on those faiths, it's kind of like, kids, kids, you're both just awful. And, and it, you know, it doesn't mean that I want to wash my hands of this, but I just want to say it's. It's possible to look at the behavior of everyone in, involved and say, you're lying, you're lying, this is disgusting behavior, and many of you are doing this because of your own particular religion. Now, I, I'm not religious, and I try and be as respectful as possible to my religious friends, but it can be quite frustrating sometimes to try and see people explain things because of whichever particular cult that they believe in that was made up during the Bronze Age. So that's my own personal beliefs about that. But when it comes to Lindsey Graham and others, they're a member of that. They're party to that. But for them, many of them, their religion, of course, is the government. But 
My concern, of course, is that with Lindsey Graham is that we get into a situation like we did with Iraq versus Afghanistan, where the desire to get into Afghanistan was really a proxy way to open the door to a war with Iraq. And of course, when John McCain was alive and Lindsey Graham and, and him were together, their, their entire goal and, and plan in life was to dethrone the Iranian regime. And it's important for us to understand the motivations behind people like Lindsey Graham and why they're trying to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. The people of Iran largely aren't in favor or supportive of the mullahs of Iran. They used to be a much more westernized and liberalized nation until the Arab revolt of 1979. And, and now we're dealing with the consequences of Western interventionism to a large extent, and we're also the consequences of blowback. Quite frankly, I believe, as Congressman Ron Paul had said in his presidential campaigns, that's who I supported in 2008 and 2012, that largely some many of our interventionists have led to the creation of more terrorists. And I think that Israel is actually very bad at optics and in in explaining to people why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that, you know, Keith has stated he's called out people like from their Knesset and from uh, uh, one of their defense ministers, for example, who say, you know, who's acting in an emotional way. And then, of course, I think it, it drives more terrorist recruitment, much like American interventionism did in the Middle East that led to the blowback that caused 9-11 those ways. So I think, you know, Keith has a good point there. But, you know, in many ways, you know, if we're if we're looking at this through the lens of America first, the number one threat in the United States to the security of People like myself, at least, I'm not sure where Keith is. I guess if he might be in Ireland, and I know you're in Australia. The number one threat is the neoconservative movement in the United States resurging and coming back into power and putting American boots on the ground. Because if they do that, and if they spark a wider conflict with Iran, and, and, with, and if you consider what the example of World War II, where you had not only what was happening in China and Japan and the conflict of Asia, and then the, the conflict of the war that broke out in Europe, that is how you get World War III, is that you have the culmination of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and Russia perhaps gets tired of the American interventionism uh, on behalf of Ukraine and says, oh, well, America's weak because they, they're already engaged in a conflict, another conflict in Iran. Maybe it's time for us to go ahead and take action somewhere else, or China, for example, and they strengthen their ties. We're in a very dangerous moment right now, and I hope that the Jews of Israel and that the Muslims of Palestine and that the Christians of the United States will all take a step back and try and find a way to have a peaceful solution at some point. Do I think that the Israelis deserve uh, to, to fight back and to take out the people who have initiated this attack? Yes, absolutely. But let's never forget that somewhere on the horizon, there has to be somewhere a goal. Keith? Well, I broadly agree in the sense that, yes, it would be nice to have people that are more moderate as far as religious extremism moderate in this. But I think it's uh, kind of denying the context to say, well, you know, you have Muslims and Christians and Jews and they all of these crazy beliefs. You know, it's unfortunate that these religious beliefs are getting in the way of it because there are specific actors that are driving this. And look, Palestine has been around a very long time. There have always been a, a, a large Christian uh, Palestinian contingent. Christians and Muslims have coexisted in that region quite well, actually. Um, the idea that Palestinian representatives are jihadists, uh, that it's somehow comparable to ISIS is, is wrong. Uh, Hamas is more like a, a national liberation movement. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, has opposed secular nationalist uh, Arab governments like, like the Assad regime. And they've supported uh, Islamist groups in destabilizing those regimes. Uh, there's an article in the Jerusalem Post about how Israel provided uh, aid to al-Nusra fighters, which is a, a branch of al-Qaeda uh, within Syria. So if we want to talk about what's driving this conflict, and you can say it's just like an inevitable clash of civilizations between you know Muslims and Christians and Jews, and they're, they're just never... Well, there was a status quo established as a relationship to the holy sites in, in Jerusalem since 1967, which meant that Jews couldn't pray on the Temple Mount, and this was respected for a time. Um, but extremist elements within Israel, and these are not just fringe cults, right? You have fringe cults in every country, right? But these are supported by the Israeli government. 
they're offering cash grants for Jews to go and pray there. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, they've been uh, storming these holy sites. There's been an uh, increased amount of reports of, as I said, Christian sites being smashed up. Uh, these prophecies and the necessity of building this third temple is increasingly being thought in public schools with funding from the Israeli government. So the religious extremism here is is coming from one side. And, you know, I know Austin says I kind of sound like a, a libtard, right? I sound like the squad. My approach to this is, is very much a, a nationalist one. You know, I agree. I don't want this to turn into a massive religious war between Muslims and Christians and Jews and, and drag all these Arab countries into it because uh, they hold a special place for, for these holy sites based on the Quran. Uh, I would favor as a nationalist, you know, a, a two-set solution where these people have their separation, have their sovereignty. We have to ask what is preventing that? What is preventing a peaceful solution like that? And I think the two drivers, it's the kind of supremacist attitude that Austin expressed earlier, where Israelis have a right to take this land, that Palestinians don't have a right to sovereignty, and Israelis are, are justified in wiping these people out and expanding these settlements that are creating a, a huge part of the conflict. And also it's this religious extremism, which is also tied to the, the supremacist attitudes where you have these guys in, in the, the Temple Institute that say um, that the, the world should be worshiping Jews and that they have a right to destroy all of these holy sites so they can build their temple. So I broadly agree, but I think we have to note where the, the extremism is coming from here. Austin? Yeah, I mean, I think we probably agree on more things than we disagree. I mean, this conflict just sort of brings out the worst in everybody, if you will. But, uh, you know, I do fall back on the belief that it, it's, you see, my, my understanding of like the right of conquest, if you will, or that I, I don't believe that the Israel's, Israelites should take the land in the Gaza Strip. I think that they should hold a proper referendum and they should give the Palestinians the opportunity to have the full human rights of Israeli citizens. So when I talk about annexation, I'm not talking about moving in and just taking it over and, you know, conquering them exactly the way that the Aztecs were conquered by the Spanish or that the Americans conquered the Native Americans. Although the Americans, of course, did give the Native Americans the opportunity to become American citizens, and many of them took that opportunity as a very good deal. And the ones, the Native Americans who took that deal have fared far better off than those who stayed in their own, well, I won't call them concentration camps, but they're not very nice places to live necessarily here in the United States. But I just want to, I guess, say, uh, finish that by saying that I think the most important thing is that we prevent the intervention militarily of American forces and we prevent the Lindsey Grahams of the world from getting involved in a wider conflict with Iran. And that I, I'm glad that you called this together, by the way, tonight, Elijah, because it is important for us to not be suckered by propaganda and not to buy into as, as emotional as we can get and as much as we pick sides, if you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, or whatever, that you at least can get your facts straight and know what the truth is of the matter. I, I, I particularly, whenever, whenever it's a conflict like this, I always slow down how much news I put out or how much I retweet in order to ensure that I'm not retweeting propaganda or fake news because right now is the most dangerous time to be doing what we do. And it's very easy to jump all over a narrative. If something, is, if something gets tweeted or pushed out in the media that I agree with, I don't immediately share it. I'm actually more skeptical of things that I read that I agree with because I know that that is a danger that I'm going to engage in a confirmation bias. So I hope more people will start to think that way and keep an open mind. And, and like I said, and, and take someone like Keith and I, if we have these, these, uh, these base differences, we can at least admit that not everything that both, uh, both of what we have said is completely wrong. And there's probably some middle ground there to find And By the way, thank you, Elijah, for hosting this, uh, this um, event for us tonight. Awesome. Keith, before you respond, because we're going to be wrapping up here, uh, you know, Austin did um, present his, you know, a solution based and did did pre present a solution. Right. Which I think is really important. Um, a lot of people have pointed out my weakness in a lot of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously being that guy that's just like, I hate terrorism. I hate genocide. And I'm getting accused of being a fence sitter. Right. It's like, well, you're not really saying anything. And the truth is, I'm not really saying anything because I don't uh, have a solution. I joked on the last show. There was a guy who had a final solution uh, with an Israeli conflict 
conflict or with the Jewish conflict, and I don't think it ended well for anyone. So that being said, you know, um, when we're talking about a solutions-based approach, you can respond to, to, to Austin, um, but I also really want you to, to respond to his idea of like, you know, the annexation or whatever he's saying here about how to deal with this. Do you agree with him and do you disagree and do you have an alternate solution? Well, I'm not sure what this referendum would involve. I mean, is it the choice that they kind of become a part of Israel or get annihilated? I mean, they have elected Hamas as as the representatives, and Israel has repeatedly refused a truce with Hamas. Uh, they've offered a truce in exchange for ending the blockade, but Israel refuses to end the blockade. And you know, if we again, if we want to talk about like the element of of Islamic extremism, I mean, Israel has had a role in in promoting that even within. Uh, Palestine, uh, there's an interesting history of, of how they've, they've promoted some of these uh, extremist Islamist groups to try and break up uh, Palestinian resistance. But Hamas uh, has offered to be part of a, a unity government in the past that would have uh, began a process of, of recognizing the Israeli state and moving towards a, a peace process. But it's always been Israel that has, that has scuppered these plans. In the case of, of this offer of a unity government, Netanyahu immediately came out and, and said he didn't want anything to do with it. And um, very shortly after, there was skirmishes, and then Israel launched this huge uh, attack on Gaza again, Operation Rudder's Keeper, and that, you know they said that this was a proof they couldn't negotiate with Hamas. So Israel, unfortunately, is is not interested in, in moving forward. They want to continue these illegal expansions into the West Bank. They want to continue this campaign of ethnic cleansing. If you wanted a solution, you know, again, I would say that I think diversity, multiculturalism drives conflict. I believe that as a nationalist, I believe that the way to get a peaceful world is to allow people peaceful separation and sovereignty. You know, I know Austin has, has libertarian priors, you know, in a sense on, on the, I have a, a certain libertarian framing in that I, I do believe non-aggression principle is a fine way to organize things, but I think that the fundamental unit is it's the nation rather than the individual. And so what I would like to see is, is that Palestinians are allowed to, to pursue their own state, um, but that's being denied by Israel. Uh, as far as like concretely, I would say again, the status quo that existed as it related to the holy sites, that the Jews could have their holy sites, but they had to respect the Muslim and Christian holy sites. If that was maintained, there wouldn't have been such a rise in tensions in Israel in the last year with all of these extremist groups in Jerusalem. I think there shouldn't be an Israeli government uh, that is sympathetic to these uh, extremist apocalyptic groups that consider non-Jews subhuman and have these insane beliefs. So I think the international community, if you want to use that term, but at least the U.S., if the U.S. stopped supporting this extremist Likudnik government and said to the Israelis and the Palestinians, you have to sit down and work out a solution. It has to be based on the sovereignty of both your peoples. And we're not going to support these you know, extremist Jewish supremacist groups. We're not going to support this constant antagonism and ethnic cleansing and illegal settlements. Just the disappearance of, of U.S. support would kind of force both sides to the negotiating table. Um, and I don't think it's happening because these people are crazy. Um, in the guess of Lindsey Graham, they probably have enough blackmail on him for a, a George or a Martin novel. Um, but I think what's driving it is, is the Israel lobby. And uh, I think it's, it's hard to deny the power of that. Uh, the most respected international relations scholar in the world, John Mearsheimer, has an excellent authoritative book on this, which is called The Israel Lobby, which documents uh, the ways in which the U.S. goes against its own kind of realist strategic interest because of the capture of the very powerful Israel lobby. APAC is, is the, the best example of that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I saw recently even Barack Obama in his memoir said that he, he wanted to try and get some kind of neutral resolution to this conflict. But what surprised them was the degree to which the Israel lobby stifled this, that they thought there should be no distance between American and Israeli policy. And whenever he tried to do anything, he ran up against politicians that were terrified of losing their seats because there'd be a well-funded campaign from the Israel lobby to run someone against them. So I think it's the extremist elements on the Israeli side that primarily are driving this. And I think the solution uh, would be for the international community to treat both sides as equals and, uh, you know, push away from these extremists. And I'm going to give you guys uh, both a second here as we close out to give your final uh, concluding thought uh, on this. And I just want to remind you guys that are watching here. Um, I didn't want to do a lot of ads on today's show uh, simply because I wanted to give free flow to the to the debate. And that's only possible um, because of your guys' support. If you go to censored.tv, uh, you know, I always like to say it's from the co-founders of Vice. Uh, it's a really great platform. Um, you can see this show is now going to be... Uh, 
the free episodes of the show are now on there uh, commercial free. So all ad reads, everything are pulled out of the show. So if you want to watch a show commercial free, it's also live streamed on there as well, but uploaded after. You can get this show, a ton of other shows that are on there. Uh, use my promo code OFFENSIVE right now. Get 10% off. Direct memberships are allowing me to do less... Uh, less uh, ad reads and shows because um, I'm able to be supported. You can also continue to join my community and support me directly at elijahshafer.locals.com. Uh, you can get basically get a year membership. You can join the official chat. You guys are in there right now. Um, I appreciate you guys uh, for, for sending it. We have a, just a couple, uh, we have a couple uh, super chats actually here uh, from why are you gay um, had said, I appreciate the neutrality, Elijah. Um, and I, what is this? Don't ever, talk to me or my son ever again i don't even i i guess i'm sucking the boob of a pepe frog you guys are weird and also toxic voice said shout out to keith um and as uh, we go into that make sure that you check it out links are in the description for the ways you can check out my vital c these are all ways to support the show because this stuff is difficult to do like austin said people don't want to talk i'm not going to name names but i've lost more friends unsurprisingly during this by not taking a st strong uh, strong approach onto one side that's unfortunately the uh, byproduct of working in conservative establishment for many years. People don't seem to really like it when you veer off course at all. Uh, to my guests, before they give their final thoughts, I just want to make sure that we get this in here. Uh, Austin and uh, Keith, can you guys please plug uh, your social media and how people can keep up with you, follow you? I know you got a show, Austin, and I know, Keith, you got a YouTube channel. Sure, yeah. I uh, My uh, five-day-a-week talk show is a morning live morning talk show every Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Central Time here in the United States. So if you're interested in uh, getting more Liberty Talk from me, then you can join us here on Rumble at rumble.com slash AP for Liberty, and that's AP, the number four, AP for Liberty. So join us every Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Tune in, uh, and uh, if you like it, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel here on Rumble as well. And I guess I'll just finish by saying this. Um, you know, first of all, the most important thing I think think in conservatives and libertarians is to maintain our America first foreign policy and to ensure that the next president of the United States has that kind of a foreign policy and to prevent a, a neoconservative takeover again uh, of the American government for peace in the Middle East, in, in my opinion. But there was a speech that Benjamin Netanyahu gave in 2015 which, uh, before the U.S. Congress. And in this speech, he laid out the possibility of the United States no longer providing foreign aid to the nation state of Israel. You have, uh, you know, the senators like Marco Rubio and congressmen like uh, Matt Gates of Florida and others, right, who set up the United States on a sort of an auto pay system. So while we're in this without a speaker of the House of Representatives, we're still footing the tax, the American taxpayers are still footing the bill for Israeli national defense, one of the wealthiest and most powerful countries in the world. And well, I, I don't believe in international, um, in, in many of these international rules that require the United States to fund foreign governments specifically because they use that to fund socialism. Uh, and sometimes that money is even diverted into terrorism and state terrorism against us in the United States. But Netanyahu in that speech made a very important point when he said that the problem with the funds that the American people send to Israel is that it always comes with strings attached. And depending on who the president of the United States is or whoever, you know, the makeup of the Congress of the United States, it, whether if it's Democrats, if it's people who oppose nationalists like ourselves or conservatives or libertarians or groipers or, or whatever we are, that money, those strings that get attached uh, will tell Israel what to do and what not to do. So Israel as a nation state uh, can't even act in its own best interests or do what's in its own best interest as a sovereign nation, as Keith was talking about. If if you believe in the the base unit as a nation state and not the individual, then I would think that at least that the United States should not be telling Israel what to do. But that probably one of the best solutions, whether you support Israel or you don't, and I morally support Israel and think we should diplomatically support them, but I don't think that we should support them financially or militarily. Uh, and so it, with that money comes strings attached. When my taxpayer dollars are being spent, I get to have a say, at least that, that you know, that, that's what most people believe. So if anything, returning to an America first foreign policy, I believe does defund, involve the defunding of Israel, despite my moral support for their cause. 
And uh, Keith, why don't you plug yourself? We got about 2,500 people watching live, and we'll probably, you know, maybe have 40, 50,000 people overall that watch this. So I really want you to follow Austin, watch his show in the mornings. It's really good. And by the way, I just want to point this out to Austin's show. Um, even though he's libertarian and whatnot, it's just a great news show. So um, if you're looking for someone who's honest, you know, I mean, you can watch uh, Ben Shapiro's people and you're going to disagree with them, uh, but they're not going to admit that when they don't know something and they're going to be uh, sort of cocky. And Austin may not agree with him on everything. Him and I don't agree. Keith and him don't agree on everything. Uh, but he's really, uh, tries to be as unbiased as possible, and it's actually quite funny. So if you're looking for a great show, check it out. Keith, go ahead and plug yourself, uh, your shows, how people can support you. A lot of new, you're being exposed to a lot of new faces tonight. Uh, and of course, give me your closing thoughts. Yeah, you can just find me Keith Woods on YouTube. I have a Rumble channel as well. I haven't really started posting much there yet. Um, Twitter, I guess, is where I'm posting mostly lately. That's at Keith Woods YT. And I would just say in closing, uh, I agree. I would hope that there would be an America first foreign policy. I think that would be better for the world to not have these these neocon wars destabilizing these relig uh, these regions. You know, I'm coming at this, as I said, from from a nationalist perspective. I'm primarily concerned about Ireland first and Europe secondarily um, and Western civilization more broadly third. And, you know, I see that the, the West loses out from these wars because we get the spillover. We get the refugees. We get the mass migration. In the case of, of the refugees that will come in from this, you know, we have these Israeli NGOs like Israel. That was one of the main NGOs that, that sent uh, migrant uh, Arabs to Germany. Now, I think the demographic replacement of, of Europeans, the demographic transformation that's happening right now is really the issue of, of our day and the fact that the nations of, of Europe are, are being uh, slowly uh, displaced and we're getting this, this new globalist form of life. I'm opposed to it. I want to protect uh, our identity. I want all Europeans to stand up for their identity. Uh, and I think all peoples should should protect their identity. And I think nationalism is, is the solution to this. And I hope that we will see push back against these narratives that are all too familiar from the Iraq war and from Syria and the kind of atrocity propaganda we got to justify all of those conflicts. Um, because the loser is, is always ordinary people in the West. Of course, the people that in the wars suffer. But like I said, there's always the spillover. Um, ordinary Westerners that oppose these wars take the blame. Uh, the Muslim world blames us. And then we take the refugees and we take people that are quite resentful of us into our lands. And it creates this this unfortunate conflict. And then you do get the oppressor oppressed dynamic where they see us as these colonial oppressors. And we have these people that have this uh, adversarial other uh, identity within our land. So that's why this concerns me. You know, I might have sounded like a, a real bleeding heart for, for Palestine tonight. But I do think it matters because, you know, if, if they are going to flatten Gaza, where are those people going to go? Um, it always seems to go one direction. They don't all flee to Egypt. Uh, it always seems to be Europe and it always seems to be uh, always seems to be the, the fighting edge men we get as well. So, you know, I'm from a country that's suffering a, a new kind of plantation um, in some ways similar to, to what the Palestinians uh, underwent with a military escort and busloads of, of military edge men into into local communities in Ireland. I think that's the, the most pressing issue for me. But certainly I look at these bigger global events and I see that there will be spillover from this and so i hope that people will take in the us and america first position uh, in europe a more isolationist position um, and push back against these neocon zionist warmongers awesome shout out to my guests austin peterson and keith woods uh, i'm so grateful for having you guys on um, i know it's always difficult uh, as taking either of your positions is going to be making enemies at this point because uh, it's never fun to side with a side in a contentious issue such as this but both of you guys i had you on because uh you know, Keith isn't ostensibly like anti-Israel or anti-Semitic or anything. He's just uh, trying to provide the facts. And uh, and uh, Austin is not some sort of like a weird, um, you know, hyper-Zionist guy who, um, you know, Jews can do no wrong. And Jewish supremacy is good. White supremacy is bad. He's not contradictory like that. And so um, these are both balanced dudes that have their own takes. And I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming on. Guys, don't forget to follow them. Links in the description. Check out our sponsor today, myvitalc.com slash offensive. Use a Offensive for $15 off. Get the energy you need with natural ingredients only. Check it out and uh, support the show at censored.tv, promo code offensive for 10% off. Those memberships directly support the show. Have a great rest of the week. And uh, Brian, you're going to have to just go ahead and uh, cut the stream here because I don't have a button, um, unfortunately, with where I'm at. Have a great rest of the week and may God bless the United States of America. I'm 